we are moving into the next session, which is uh, contributed oral presentations 06. So we have three presentations. So first is by Pete Camper, who is going virtually, followed by Quintin Groom, uh, who is here, and then followed by Christian Brownick, uh, who is also going to talk virtually. So uh, let's move to uh, the next presenter, uh, Pete Campbell. Uh, I guess he's online. Pete, uh, can you hear us? Hello. Hi. Uh, would you like to share your screen, your presentation? Yeah. Give me one second to get that set up. Please. Thanks. All right. How do we look on your end? Looks good. Yeah, no, better. Yes. Please go ahead. Okay. Uh, so first of all, thank you all for joining me. Uh, I want to say thank you again to the staff for making this virtual presentation possible. I really appreciate it. And I know many other people have as well. So, uh, so today I just want to share with you guys um, a little geo retroactive georeferencing technique that I came up with um, that's helped me work through some issues I've been having. So first of all, the, some background. Uh, I'm currently working on a National Science Foundation um, project with the rest of my lab collecting and tracking tick-borne diseases across the Great Plains, which includes Kansas and Oklahoma and Nebraska and a few other states in the United States. Um, so we're collaborating with six other colleges, uh, and so far this has been going on for three or four years, and we've collected thousands and thousands of ticks. My part of the project right now is uh, basically I was handed this notebook from a researcher um, at Kansas State University, and it's got about 1,500 historical records of collected ticks, and uh, my job is to put... Um, a coordinate pair on every single one of those records and add um, coordinate, coordinate uncertainty in meters, which is basically just a line to the farthest um, reaches of where the sample might have been collected from. And then eventually this information will all be published in Darwin Core Standard. So the current problem that I have uh, is that lots and lots of the data in this notebook is all from citizen scientists. That is to say, people that didn't have GPS locations, basically, they found a tick on them or their pets, and then they mailed it into this researcher at Kansas State and just had some vague description of where the sample was collected from. Um, if you work in a museum, there's a good chance that you have found many, many specimens in your collections with something similar. Um, so about 25% of all these uh, specimens in, the, in this particular notebook have the word near describing them or some form of that. So that is to say, what does it mean to be near something, okay? So here you can see uh, the shape of the city of Lawrence. So these are the, the city bounds basically. And you can see where the, the gray figure stops is essentially the border of the city. So if somebody was to describe a sample as within Lawrence, you would expect it to be within the shape. Well, what if somebody says near Lawrence? Well, mailing addresses go all the way out here, which is a full 13 kilometers away from the city. That's a big deal in terms of your, the uncertainty for your sample. Um, so normally if the sample was inside Lawrence, we would put the coordinates here at the dead center of the city, and then draw a point to the farthest point of the city, which would be up here. And that'd be about, you know, three to five kilometers. Well, over doubling the uncertainty makes a big difference when you're talking about the scale of uncertainty for your samples. So the current solution, that is the GBIF agreed upon standard as of right now, and the basically the georeferencing guide, is to find the shape of your locality. So let's say your sample was found in Salina, the city of Salina. Here's the shape. Here's all the little surrounding cities. So you find your shape, and then you just arbitrarily expand the border. 
this is no, you know, this is completely arbitrary. Um, this border right here that I've made around Salina in this example is only half a kilometer, but there's nothing to say it shouldn't be, you know, five kilometers or stretch the nearest city or, you know, all completely made up numbers essentially. Um, if you work in museums, you probably have some kind of standard that you use. So if somebody just listed a city, you might arbitrarily say, um, you know, anything listed as near a city is just a five kilometer bubble surrounding that city. Well, I wanted something more systematic, something more, I don't know, less human, <laughs> more, more mathematical. So I've started using uh, Veroni tessellations. Uh, I think it's Veroni. Nobody's ever given me a clear consensus on how to pronounce the name. Veronois, I'm going to say Veroni. So here's an example of the United States. You can see all the little individual states are outlined. Here's Kansas. And each yellow dot is an airport, okay? And say you're out here in the middle of Kansas and you're not sure which airport you're closest to because here's an Oklahoma airport, the Kansas airport, and a Colorado airport, all in the general vicinity. Well, using a Veroni tessellation, you can make a Veroni diagram. And essentially, each cell, that is each yellow airport here, has their own shape associated with them. And each shape basically describes the area encompassing, like the shape describes the, the zone in which each cell is closer to that specific spot than any other spot. So if you're up here in northeastern Nebraska, you are closer to the Kansas City airport than any other airport. If you're in western Nebraska, you're closer to the Colorado one, because this whole shape describes the entire area that is quite explicitly nearer this airport than any other. And if you're wondering how to do these calculations, um, in QGIS, which is an open source um, geographic information system mapping tool, uh, it's it's like three button clicks. You just take all your cells, go to vector geometry tools, and it's right here for your easy, convenient use. So <laughs> if you wanna play around with this concept a little on your own, it's very simple to do so. So some implementations that I've been using it for so far. So again, let's, let's go back to Salina. Here's our city. Let's say a sample was found near Salina, all right? So we're gonna do some Veronoi tessellations. And here I've used the vertices of the shape itself as the cells and the diagram. And then I merged all their zones together. So essentially this area would be your new polygon that you use to describe the location. So the new center would be about in here. And then you draw your uncertainty in meters to probably about here. And you can see that's quite different than, you know, the, the centroid is about a kilometer, a kilometer and a half off but the uncertainty in meters is much larger. Same with uh, like a rural address that doesn't have a city address. If it has a rural address, it quite literally means it's not within the bounds of the city and it's out here somewhere. Uh, another example is like a, court, um, a cardinal direction. So here, if we were described as Northwest of Salina, it's not the city of Salina, it's the territory surrounding it and it's in the chunk Northwest of it. So here you can see, I basically taken the Veroni diagram and I've carved out the Northwestern slice that is associated with Salina. It's not Southeast of Culver, it's not Southwest of Bennington and it's not Northeast of Bavaria. It is Northwest of Salina. Then on a smaller scale, I've also found this is quite helpful for um, basically addresses. So I had a list of addresses, but I did not have the shapes of every individual house's territory. So you run a Veroni dilation or Veroni tessellation and get this nice diagram. And you can see how each little property is actually carved out pretty well by the, the algorithm. It even follows the mm -hmm. roads too, quite nicely. Um, yeah, so some shortcomings and some things I wanna work on in the future. So first of all, if your data set that you're using to provide the cells is incomplete, um, you're going to have, you know, less accurate shapes. Now, the good thing is that when you're working with uncertainty, it's always better to err on the side of caution and have a better, like a larger uncertainty than a smaller one. 
and less data is only going to make your your diagrams larger which is going to make your uncertainty larger so it kind of self-corrects itself um, but still it could be a lot more accurate the more complete your data set is and the other problem is it still requires a degree of interpretation so here's the city of wichita which is the largest city in kansas by population and almost by size and you can see all these little towns that kind of outline it and the the Veroni diagram of Wichita is being hemmed in because of these other diagrams that are competing for it with space. Um, but if you were out here near Clearwater, it's likely that somebody would still describe it as near Wichita, given that it's a much more significant reference point. So uh, one possible solution is to use weighted Veroni diagrams. So you can see here in this bottom left uh, diagram, it's starting to envelop the smaller one. This is still a degree of interpretation because you would need to weight the individual, um, basically the, the, the individual cells that you're using. But this is a good start to overcoming that kind of pro problem. Um, some things that I very recently started working on is uh, I found good success with rivers and paths whose um, shape itself is not well described by a large uncertainty circle, but uh, a Veroni diagram might be able to provide a better solution to basically expand like putting a a, a bubble around um, those individual shapes and that's uh, that's all i have for you today thank you so much do you guys have any questions for me thanks peter uh, there is one online in the meantime i would suggest uh, quentin if you could get your mic thing done so there is one by Vijay Barve. Uh, his question is, how do you geolocate PO Box 61? And how do you geolocate have a quick... PO Box 61? Yeah, so um, PO Boxes are the same as rural addresses in this context. That is to say, um, it's essentially somebody that doesn't have a normal, um, uh, like a normal city address and thus is, essentially relying on um, the uh, like a, an additional mailbox at a different site. So um, here I'm just assuming that it's a rural address and it's not found within the bounds of the city. It's found outside of the bounds of the city. And even if it was found within the city, it's still being, I mean, the, di the Veroni diagram is still fully encompassing the city. And so it should do a good enough job to encompass um, still do a good enough job to encompass the range in which the individual that uses that PO box would be located. That's at least how I see it. Dr. Chapman here, Peter. Thank you for your very interesting talk. And I'm sure that we'll collaborate a bit in the future about some of this. Um, I'm interested in, in some of the aspects that we had even bigger problems with, for example, off, which is a version of veer, so off the coast or off Rottnest Island or something yeah, yeah. Where, mm -hmm. you, where you don't have a, a close endpoint. And this sure. was always one that we've had a lot of discussion and, and problems with. Uh, yeah, I, I think, so I've recently started working with water in this data set and it's been an issue to say the least. Um, so you can imagine with lakes, if somebody describes a tick as the their only reference point they give is near Tuttle Creek Lake, for instance, well, the tick's not gonna be in the middle of the lake, almost certainly. Um, so uh, I've started trying to implement um, these, di these Veroni diagrams again, basically anywhere that I feel like I need to use a buffer region, I s have been trying to somehow worm Veroni diagram diagrams into that solution. So with lakes, um, the, the diagrams are quite massive because in Kansas, lakes are, are often far apart. Um, but I found that it's usually good enough um, at describing <laughs> the area around it. I'm sure there's, you know, you could add into a data set of like, if you have lakes, you can throw in cities with the lakes and thus that kind of makes your, it hymns in your space a lot more. Uh, as far as like coasts go, that that seems um, 
<laughs> I don't know how you would go about doing that. I guess you could still use Veroni diagrams, but the, the coast would kind of have to end at some point. Otherwise, it would be the US's diagram would go like halfway across the Pacific. So, um, yeah, that's an interesting, it, that is a, a major limitation of this process is that at some point, um, you just have to stop. You just like, if, if you don't have a complete data set and the, the object you're looking at is not in the middle of the diagram, this is tough. There, now I will say on QGIS, you can do buffer regions. So you can basically make these shapes expand out infinitely. So you can st still kind of get a projection of it and then you can decide where you want to draw the line while still maintaining the shape. But yeah, that's an interesting, that's an interesting problem I hadn't thought of in the middle of landlocked Kansas. I guess we can continue that discussion on the Slack. So th thanks, Peter, for your talk. Yeah, thank you. Uh, let's let's move on to our next speaker, Quintin. Well, after Deborah's talk, you'd think I was going to come up here and talk about ecosystems of organisms, but I'm going to actually talk about ecosystems of people, and uh, particularly the people in our collections, the people who collect, the people who uh, identify and work in collections, and how our collections don't have to be uh, full of anonymous people uh, with just names. And this is part of a uh, 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 project that we've been running uh, for the last something like two years, it's certainly the whole of the pandemic, uh, where all of these people got together uh, once every couple of weeks. Uh, many of these people are in the crowd at the moment, and uh, we'll be very willing to, uh, there's Deborah waving over there, uh, they'll be very willing to answer your questions afterwards as well. And this was just published uh, last week, uh, sort of our, our personal magnum opus on disambiguation of people names. I should also refer you back uh, to the Wikidata session. I think it was yesterday or was it the day before? I can't remember. But uh, if you want to see the recordings of Erica Krimmel and of Sabine von, von Mehring, they did some wonderful talks on the use of Wikidata uh, in the disambiguation of people as well. And that dovetails very nicely with this talk as well. Uh, so why disambiguate people in collections? Um, you can discover the uses of your collections in research, which is very useful to justify why having collections. Um, you can uh, see somebody's individual contribution to the collection uh, that you have. And so you can see one person's sort of value in, within the collection. You can look at that whole person's work throughout time in between different collections, for instance. Uh, you can also aggregate all of the data on people and look at the institutional impact of your collection uh, because you can identify individuals within it and all of the people within your collection. Um, you can find interesting things about your collection and find out why your collection is different from other people's collections and why your collection particularly has certain value. You can see how your collection in the past and in present is collaborating with other collections and where you have things in common uh, and where you work together. And you can increase the visibility of the people who perhaps collect, um, perhaps do a lot of work within the collection, identifications, what have you, but may not publish, but still have a valu very valuable place within collections. And you can reveal unknown uses of your uh, data um, in the collection that you may not have thought of. We think a lot about taxonomy within collections, but there are a lot of other uses of, uh, of uh, collections which may not necessarily end up um, as published authors on papers, they still get used. So collections are a, a, a common uh, resource for everybody. They are made by people, for people, uh, and for research and for knowledge and they should be treated as that, and that's why disambiguating the people of it is important. So what do we need to do as individuals and as institutions and as collections to make sure our collections are all unambiguous? Well, we have all the tools to do this. In actual fact, if you all went away and if people listening online went away and started disambiguating things, we could finish. We could have everyone who wants to be uh, um, or what, 
un unambiguous to be uh, unambiguous in our collections and we can link up collections that way we have identifiers uh empowering this work such as the gbf dois for data sets where the collections are we have uh, global unique identifiers for specimens we have tools such as binomia does anyone everyone use binomia good good <laughs> good show of hands nice uh, we have Wikidata identifiers, which make it possible to identify people who are, who are dead. And we, we heard before in the Wikidata session how Wikidata is great for aggregating uh, <clears throat> biographical information. And we have ORCID identifiers uh, for living individuals. And I have my number on the back in case you need to know it. So we came in our paper to seven uh, things that you could do to help this. So promoting the use of personal identifiers within your institutions. So when someone submits specimens to be lodged in your collection, you should perhaps ask them at that point to give their ORCID ID or to register from an ORCID, um, but also make you using your ORCID in every occasion you possibly can also helps promote the use of ORCIDs. Um, in terms of the use of things like ORCIDs, uh, there's Sandra Knapp, and this is her Wikidata uh, page, but she is like the Kevin Bacon of the botanical world. So she has an amazing network of publications. She's incredibly energetic, uh, incredibly prolific in terms of her publications. And I suspect everyone here is much less than within seven degrees of freedom to Sandra Knapp, and it'd be kind of interesting to know uh, where we all stand. I'm actually there as, I think I published one paper with Sandra Knapp, very minor co-author. Um, so increase the number of collection management systems using personal identifiers. Yes, we need to get the data out there. We need to get it published to GBIF. So I know we have at least one collection management uh, person within um, uh, who was here. I can't see him in the crowd at the moment. Yes, it's Yevgeny. Yes, we need personal identifiers within collection man management systems, and we need to make sure they're all interoperable. So, for instance, this is data on GBIF, and you won't be able to see this very well, but this is all for someone called uh, J.A. Ratter. All of these are coming from different collections, all put in in different ways in those collections, and so there's no standardization. This is why we need uh, stable identifiers for people, because if you try and pick out all the Ratter's work out of GBIF, it's very difficult. Um, this is an example from Melbourne Herbarium. Uh, where one of our co-authors works and she uses specify and this is the uh, variance of that person's name the person is James uh, Hamlin Willis and you can see there's short versions of the name the Wikidata ID there's other IDs from other different databases and this helps us bridge between those different databases there's another example here from Taxon Works which Deb can explain to you in great detail but again uh, they have ways of putting multiple identifiers in and using those identifiers along with biographical data. Uh, standards, well, uh, we do not have a person identifier standard as such, but you can put recorded by ID and identified by e ID into Darwin Core. That's relatively new. Um, you can put multiple identifiers in there if you have collector teams, but it's a bit messy, and that's why we really would like to make an extension. I'll talk about that a bit more in a second. Um, it's also possible to use uh, ABCD3, uh, which accommodates, accommodates identifiers for people, and I'm sure David Fischmuller would probably explain that better than I would. The so ORCID. Um, it's a non-for-profit organization. They don't sell your data to um, advertisers or anything like this. They're, they're funded uh, through the organizations that become members of that, very much it's like Hadwig does, to be quite honest. Um, and uh, yes, you should use your ORCID, as I do. Um, but you can also help ORCID. So ORCID has a lot of promotional materials you can use in your own organization. This is a Dutch version of that. Uh, there are many languages covered, but if you don't, your language is not covered, why don't you just volunteer and say, well, I could translate that into whatever language you want. I'm sure they'd be very happy for you to do that. Okay. Uh, undertake disambiguation work in the national languages of many countries. That's a uh, a no-brainer. Um, people are, know the names of people in their own countries much better than people 
who don't speak the language, they know which are male names, which are female names, and, and things like this. That makes it a lot easier. Uh, get into Wikidata, put your people into Wikidata. Wikidata is only a secondary source, so you have to make sure there's primary sources for things. So publish obituaries in your journals, for instance, and that helps everybody and helps give people uh, a face as well. Increase the number of people in collections with expertise in disambiguation, get onto binomia, run workshops. It's actually a fun thing to do. And if you look at uh, Sabina von Mehring's uh, and Erica Kimmel's uh, presentations, you'll see how that can be put into practice. And work with us to work towards an exchange standard for uh, attribution data. So we have a task group and an interest group, the attribution interest group. Uh, David Shortans is uh, one of the main members of that from Canada, and we are working towards that. That's our next goal after our disambiguation paper. And this talk is a product of the People in Biodiversity Data Task Group uh, from Tadwig. Please do get involved. These are all the institutions of the people involved in that moment. I have to thank all of those. And I need to thank all of the different organizations that we took little bits of money and time from to put this all together. Um, sometimes it's very complicated. For instance, Mobilize helped us organize workshops. Uh, Disco Fair Synthesis, Disco Flanders all had a contribution. And towards the end, Bicycles also helping uh, as well because it's all about linking data. Uh, and that's all for me. Thank you. Super. Uh, we are running a couple of minutes behind the schedule, but we can still manage to squeeze one quick question if you have. Or we can catch it on the Slack. <laughs> okay. Cool. Yeah. So uh, let's move on to our next speaker. Uh, thanks, Quintin. So our next speaker is Christian Raunik, uh, who is going to do it virtually. Uh, Christian, can you hear us? I can hear you. I hope you can hear me. Yeah, uh, would you like to share your screen? I would. Uh, okay, I hope you can see it. That looks good, okay. Yeah, so good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to introduce you to the ASV table registry, which my colleagues and I have been developing as part of the GMO3 Dark Texa project at the Leibniz Institute for the Analysis of Biodiversity Change. The whole thing is accessible at belgermany.de slash ASV minus registry in case you want to check it out as I talk. And we've been developing this to close the gap or bridge the gap that we're seeing currently in metabarcoding research. For anyone that's not familiar, metabarcoding uh, is a very potent tool for the analysis of environmental samples and lets us find out the species composition. composition sorry. Most basically, we take an environmental sample and we extract, amplify, and sequence the DNA within it and then cluster it into ampli sorry, into ASVs, which then allow us to identify the species within them. And it outperforms traditional identification by human experts in terms of amount, speed, and quality, given that good reference material is there. Because of its potency, we expect it to be a future standard method for all biological research, where species occurrence and distribution is of interest, for example, ecological research or monitoring projects. So ASV tables, which is what we are most concerned with, are the outcome of the clustering step. What do they look like? They usually have several comments, uh, columns, sorry, the rightmost of that tends to be the sequences. So those are the sequences extracted from the actual samples. In the middle, each column represents the, the sampling plot. So the different maybe soil samples or malaise traps and the numbers in the middle tell us how many times each of those sequences on the right was found in each of the respective sampling plots. We can extend how much this table tells us by actually annotating it taxonomically, so finding the species 
that corresponds to each of the sequences on the right. We do this by searching for the sequences in reference databases, such as, such as GBOL or BOLD, using tools like BLAST, BOLD ID Engine, or Research. Very important to note here is that as reference databases grow over time and become more precise in their identifications, uh, as well as as tools get better, these text on annotations, the identifications in the tables uh, are subject to change over time. So they might in the very least get more precise or change as well. In the case of our registry, these annotations look like here. So the green box is what gets added to the ASV table when you do one of these annotations. So we add the font taxonomy and then for the respective reference databases used, several columns as well. So the, the taxon found within that reference database as well as the specific specimen. And we also give you the hit percentage uh, score as well. Now that we know what these ASV tables look like and that they're quite potent, we also got to see that their use at the moment is not very fair. They are hardly accessible, hardly findable because they're in the vast majority of cases stored and published only as supplementary material, which makes using them at a later point for analyses across projects difficult and error prone. So we see that there's a lag for a central platform for these ASV tables where they have completed a life cycles that adhere to the FAIR principles. Magnify already provides a platform to upload and annotate environmental DNA samples. However, this is not ASV table specific. And this is where we hope our ASV table registry will fill that gap. What does our registry allow you to do? First and foremost, you can upload and manage your ASV tables on it, as the name suggests. And we also provide for versioning. So say you uploaded a ASV table, and then you did several steps of, of annotation, or you changed the data, each of those changes, those annotations will be accompanied by the creation of a new version. And that way you can track all of these changes independently. And then also maybe at a later point, publish these different versions independently. You can register ASV sequences. So in a normal use case where you upload an ASV table, the ASV sequences contained within that table will be uploaded and registered automatically in tandem to the table, but you can also upload them as standalone data. By assigning a DOI, you can publish your tables and make them a lot more findable and publicly visible on the registry. For this, we use the Datasite Fabrica API. Once uploaded, you can retrieve, well, first search and then retrieve uploaded data, for example, by sequence data, by the text identified within a table or sequence, as well as occurrence data. And we also provide APIs to retrieve said data. As I've said before, you can, or we allow for the taxonomic annotation in the registry, that's an important step. And we allow this to occur as many times as you want. So if you have maybe a data set that you wanna reanalyze after some time has passed, no problem at all. This will be a new version as well that you can also handle apart from all the other previous versions or future versions. Finally, we also keep track of any search methods or parameters that you used for your taxonomic annotations. We provide several reference databases to be used as well as multiple search tools. What does the data lifecycle look like that I've mentioned? So first of all, we use what we call projects as the central data containers in order to, to foster collaborative work. So everyone, all the members within a project have all uh, the same access to every piece of data that's uh, there or that has been uploaded within the project. So that's usually gonna be ASV tables and ASV sequences. As I've said, when you upload an ASV table, the ASV sequences will be 
registered as well automatically in tandem. Which is useful as when you then at a later point might do taxonomic annotations, maybe once or repeatedly, all the annotations done to the table will be backtracked to the ASV sequences so that if you do use them as standalone data, they will also carry annotations done to them as part of a table. And then if you're happy with any version, you can then assign the DOI and publish it like I mentioned before, and then it will be publicly visible on the registry, therefore much more findable. What do we want to focus on going forward? We want to incorporate the MIXS standard, so provide a certain minimum quantum of data for each uh, piece of data on the registry. And we also intend to submit published data to INSDC, probably using established workflows from GFBio and NFDI for biodiversity. To quickly recap, we see metabarcoding as the future standard for any biological research where species composition and distribution are of interest. And they're quite potent in, or the ASU tables are quite potent in the data they hold. However, at the moment, that potential is kind of wasted just because there's hardly any access to them. And we want to change that with our ASV table registry by allowing for the upload and annotation, the finding and retrieval, as well as publication and archival of these files in one central place, and thereby hopefully making ASV tables fair finally. Like I've said in the beginning, the whole thing is accessible at bullgermany.de slash ASV minus registry if you do want to check it out. That's it from my side. If there's any questions, suggestions, or ideas, don't hesitate to bring them up. Thank you. Super. Thank, thanks, thanks, Christian. Uh, do we have a question for Christian? Yeah. Lubu has one. Hello. Um, did you explore the potential of the biome format for storing metabarcoding data in your work? Uh, I'm pretty sure. Thing. Yeah, we. I'm, I, I think we did, but came to the conclusion that keeping the format as it is in the the way I've shown you is the most useful for us, um, since that is usually how the data is going to look coming into the registry when uploaded. But I would also like to refer that to Peter or Bjorn, my colleagues, in case I have something to add. Yeah, Peter here from Bonn, Germany. Hello, can you hear me? I can hear uh, you. Peter, you're a little bit uh, low. low. Uh, can you increase the volume, please? I try to speak up a little. Okay, so we are uh, aware of the biome format and want to intend to use it to deliver uh, this ASV uh, based data to, to GBIF. As far as I know, GBIF is also um, using that for this kind of um, data, but currently we are somehow stuck in the development as the biome format fits Better, better into interaction data, doesn't it? So, so Peter, you have a question for anyone specific or is it going back to Lubomir? Yeah, it's going back. <laughs> Okay. So I really missed the question. I'm very sorry about that. Uh, if you can repeat it. Yeah, um, we are, um, and now I see myself, now it's better. Um, we are aware of the biome format and, but our um, impression is that it's 
that it fits better for exchanging data containing interactions of specimens, not for ASV data. Or am I okay, completely okay. mistaken here? Well, the biome format is rather universal and uh, ENA work on creating a repository for biome files. That's uh, where my question came. If you have exported potential to use in your work. Yeah, but thank you for the explanation, of course, yeah. Okay, I guess we are right on time to end the session. So I would like to thank uh, all the presenters here and also like to thank Shelly and Steve for helping to organize this and moderate the session. Also a big thanks to the technical team who uh, let us keep the show running and let's end this session and go for a coffee. Thank you very much. That's what we 